I'm delighted to introduce our uh, third session today, which is going to be our keynote session. Uh, and the speaker is going to be Maury Obsfeld. Uh, Maury uh, Obsfeld is the C. Fred Bergson Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the Class of 1958 Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of California at Berkeley. From 2015 through 2018, he served as Economic Counselor and Director of Research at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, during 2014 and 2015, he was a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. He co-authored International Economics with Paul Krugman and Mark Mellitz, Foundations of International Macroeconomics with Ken Rogoff, and Global Capital Markets with Alan Taylor. Uh, many, many, many economists, myself included, have used and benefited from his book, one or more of his books and uh, past research. Prior to joining the economics department at UC Berkeley, oh, here he is, okay, I was just was worried you weren't. Uh, it's like, is he here? <laughs> that would be a little uncomfortable, uh, but he, he's, he's there. Um, he held faculty appointments at Columbia University and at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a visiting appointment at Harvard University. He is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a distinguished fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research. In 2023, Obsfeld was named a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. I could truly go on and on about his many accomplishments and publications and so forth over the years, but instead, I am gonna turn it over to uh, Maury Obsfeld to, to and it shed light on some of the topics. I, is there a title? It's the lunch keynote, for our lunch keynote. So here, here we go, Maury. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. Ooh. Oh, you good? Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. We made it. Um, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here at CPRI, to be here again, because it's not my first time. That's right. Uh, happily. And, um, you know, it's really uh, gratifying that the topic is the world economy, globalization, um, at a time when there's so much stress in the world, which seems to be getting much worse rather than better. Um, the first two panels were great. I'm looking forward to two other great panels. And I think what I have to say today will dovetail well and give some more perspective on where we are and how we got where we are. Uh, so let me, let me give you the theme. I, I, I have limited time, so I'm, I'm going to try to uh, uh, keep it brief uh, before going into a, a conversation with Mark. But the basic themes I want to put forth are that um, uh, this year is actually the 50th anniversary of the collapse of the fixed exchange rate system that was established at Bretton Woods in 1973. So it's fitting to think about the great achievement of those multilateral institutions that were set up then, look a little bit at what they accomplished, and think about how that system collapsed and why and what the forces were. Because in some respects, very similar forces have brought us to this stage uh, of the global economy where we talk about fragmentation, deglobalization. Um, it's not like you, you build globalization and it stays there forever. Uh, the, the arc of history does not necessarily move toward globalization and history, history shows that. Um, what I'll turn to though is, is what, what are the legacies of the post-war system that we can build on and how important it is to do so in the light of uh, the core challenges that face the global economy, some of which were not even contemplated at the end of World War II. So, um, Bretton Woods Agreement, July 1944. I like this picture of Keynes particularly because you see him sitting between the Soviet and the Yugoslavian representatives at the Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, the USSR was a signatory. It ultimately did not join um, the IMF, uh, but uh, Russia did much later on um, in the 1990s. And the goal of the Bretton Woods system, uh, first of all, was to uh, promote recovery from the war on a basis of international trade, uh, fairly open markets, and therefore to promote economic growth throughout the world, and hopefully uh, prosperity, and hopefully even peace in light of the devastating damage that World War II um, caused. Uh, the idea of the Bretton Woods system was 
to sort of have a trade-off between global rules and um, uh, the ability of sovereign governments to implement stabilization policies. How did the system do? Well, I would argue that the system did pretty well. Um, this is a long-run graph of uh, uh, merchandise trade relative to GDP in the world economy, going back to 1830. And what you can see is that um, from the trough of, um, I'm hoping, oh no, I don't have a little pointer. But from the trough of the Great Depression and the war, trade actually grew significantly. By about 1980, it had reached the um, uh, uh, levels of um, the, the first great age of globalization. And then it suddenly, suddenly took off. Um, in terms of growth, uh, I don't have time to go into detail on this graph, which is quite interesting. It shows growth over the four decades starting in 1950. But if you look at the right-hand side, you can see that uh, uh, growth uh, was high in the first two decades after 1950. Um, this partly reflected catch-up. But part of, the, part of the goal of Bretton Woods was to allow the world economy to catch up, uh, not to become fragmented as it had been during the 1930s. Growth declined in the um, 70s globally, declined further in the 80s with um, uh, differences across countries and regions. Another important point about the uh, uh, Bretton Woods system is that when it was created, uh, the world was still a world to some degree of empires, of colonies. This is the map in 1945 of what the world looked, looked like then. Over the course of the 50s and the 60s, much of this colonization went away. Uh, countries became independent. But one, one reason I put this map up is because the legacy of colonialism is still with us in international politics. And we touched on that uh, today. Think about the, uh, uh, the level of support in what we now call the Global South for um, sanctions on Russia and how this is, this is played out. Uh, that, 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 I would argue, is a very important factor for the US to be taking into account, and it is in its global uh, economic diplomacy. Uh, as I said in uh, 1973, the fixed exchange rate system collapsed. Uh, economists who wrote in the 1930s and 40s, and on the basis of whose writings the Bretton Woods architects built a fixed exchange rate system, might have forecast that with the fragmentation of the global currency system, we might see uh, a collapse in world trade, uh, lower growth in um, international um, transactions. But in fact, the opposite happened. Uh, maybe we'll discuss this more during the Q&A, but as you can see from this graph, um, uh, trade uh, uh, globalization, uh, uh, this is the far right-hand graph, uh, became hyper-globalization. It rose exponentially before recently leveling off as a percent of GDP um, around the time of the financial crisis. So it is not as if great trade has retracted or shrunk relative to GDP. It's just not growing much faster than GDP, as was the case in the past. Um, if you look at the far left graph, this is one measure of financial globalization, the ratio of countries' net external claims to GDP. Um, this also exploded starting in the 1990s. And although the pace of growth has certainly slowed since the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, this measure continues to expand. Um, FDI, which is the central graph, also expanded, uh, uh, grew precipitously uh, in the 1990s. It has since retracted. Um, part of this expansion, though, uh, reflects the fact that FDI data is quite imperfect as a measure of factories being built in countries, which is what you might associate it with. Often these are debt transactions, and the fact that Luxembourg attracts a lot of FDI should be a tip-off 
uh, over, over, over that fact. And some of the decline in FDI is not really globalization receding, but it's attempts by governments to get some of this under control. Okay. Um, what can we say about this period of hyperglobalization? You know, my title of this talk was uh, Successes, Excesses, and New Stresses. Um, uh, parts of hyperglobalization were probably damaging. Uh, the the uh, stupendous growth of finance was not entirely welfare improving. And the fact that this period ended with a massive global financial crisis can be viewed as some evidence of that. But in terms of trade, um, countries benefited. The advanced countries benefited um, on average. There were distributional effects, of course. But emerging and developing economies benefited greatly in terms of living standards, poverty eradication, um, health metrics like longevity, infant mortality, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and I could, I could go on. But let me come back to this theme about the, the sort of unstable dynamics of globalization. Now, we certainly see these in the Bretton Woods experience. It's not a, an accident at all that the system collapsed uh, uh, in stages. Um, one stage was President Nixon's departure from gold in 1971 the abandonment of fixed exchange rates in 1973, um, the oil shocks, all of this is caught up in, a in the same dynamic, inflation as well, which I could go on for for an hour, but I don't have an hour. Um, what are some of the mechanisms? Well, financial market excesses. Um, these inevitably lead to crises, retrenchment, uh, more regulation. Um, domestic politics. To the extent that trade is successful in changing the world for good, it also inflicts structural changes that can redistribute incomes, that can upset communities, that can lead to uh, cultural anomie and, and backlash. Um, certainly this happened in the Bretton Woods system with the rise of Europe, Japan, exactly what was meant to happen but it caused import penetration in the US and political stresses. Um, geopolitics is important. Uh, with the growth of economies outside of the US, um, the US hegemony has been, has been challenged. Uh, first, there was Europe uh, uh, pulling together to uh, create the European Union. Um, now China has risen, and it challenges the US hegemonic position. And whereas when you're a hegemon, when you're most of world G GNP, you can internalize public goods that you, uh, that you deliver, this becomes much less so when you're um, no longer the hegemon and when you're not uh, more than a quarter of US GDP, where, where the US has kind of been stuck for several decades now. Um, why should we reduce emissions when China is emitting so much um, so collective action becomes much more important. Um, some stresses that we can see um, in, uh, in recent data in terms of fragmentation, uh, the global trade alert measure of, um, of stricter trade policies certainly spikes up during COVID, and it has not receded. It has remained high. Uh, a measure of trade policy uncertainty based on the famous Baker, Bloom, and Davis measure uh, spikes up and it has come down somewhat, but it remains double its average historical level. What are the stress factors? We've talked about a lot of these. Um, uh, we talked about the Trump policies, which have not been reversed in full at all by the Biden administration. Globalization, backlash. Um, the stresses around the pandemic, uh, shortages of uh, medical supplies, supplies, um, issues about the global distribution of vaccines, growing, growing US-China tensions, uh, China's revisionist aspirations, and uh, uh, the security issues that were a big topic this morning. Um, industrial policies, 
different approaches to climate policies. If you look at the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, um, green subsidies were widely applauded. The fact that they applied differentially to autos assembled in the US or not assembled into the US, autos with different levels of domestic content uh, for the battery uh, uh, production uh, was not so widely applauded and has led to t trade tensions and workarounds by the United States. Uh, the uh, um, carbon border adjustment mechanism that Europe has uh, put in place uh, also um, is a cause of tensions. And uh, tensions over the Ukraine war, sanctions, uh, including the weaponization of the dollar system, uh, fears about choke points in global supply chains, um, uh, and I should add something that surprisingly we didn't talk about this morning, especially when we were talking about the slippery slope toward war, um, the tensions in the Mideast, which I think are going to um, roil the global economy and global cooperation in a way that is uh, very hard to predict. Um, global cooperation, though, is more essential than ever. Um, there are global common threats that need collective action to be resolved adequately. A very partial list would be most obviously climate, but also health, uh, which has receded a little bit, but is still very much on the, uh, on the horizon. We shouldn't forget about this. Cyber risks, including terrorist financing, which has also been in the news uh, today. Uh, and nuclear proliferation, something we kind of forgot about, but um, as we look at the threats around the war in Ukraine, uh, we, we, we have to uh, realize that you know, we have um, new state actors on the brink of developing nuclear weapons. We have um, uh, the possibility of non-state actors getting their hands on nuclear material. Uh, this is something we don't really talk about uh, or think about enough. Um, what should the US do? got less than a minute to talk about this. We can talk about it more. Give me a couple more minutes. OK. Um, uh, Oleg brought up the IFIs this morning. And I've talked a little bit about their history and what they accomplished after World War uh, uh, II. Um, I think we should, as a country, now I'm talking about the US, but also the West more generally, uh, double down on these institutions. I don't think now is the time to say, well, they don't work. They're outmoded. You know, let's do something else. Let's make bilateral deals. The most recent uh, cover of Foreign Policy magazine, if you read it, was basically multilateralism is dead. You know, people are making deals. That's fine. I don't think that's right. And if you look at the challenges I set out, it's not going to cut it for dealing with those those challenges. Um, we need to find ground to cooperate with China in ways that don't endanger our security. Um, and it's happening in some venues. Uh, for example, you may not know that since 2021, uh, there have been a large number of co-financing agreements between the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the World Bank for climate projects in the Global South. This is, this is really important. Um, the AIIB has set out a climate action plan. And coordinating with the World Bank, coordinating with the West, I think would be important in being more effective. Um, I think we, as a country uh, now, need to invest in our relations with the Global South. As I said, that legacy of colonialism is very much still there. I mean, why does South Africa support Russia? It goes back decades to the Soviet Union being vocally against apartheid when the US was not. And um, that's a dynamic that I think it's in our interest to break. Biden administration has made a number Biden-Harris administration has made a number of uh, initiatives in this regard. One really important one was to welcome the African Union as a member of the G20, which I guess is now the G21. Um, this, is, this is really important. Uh, uh, the global south uh, needs to be better represented. Africa is where population is going to grow most in the coming years. And having them at the table is really going to be critical. Um, there are multilateral projects that can command widespread support in the domestic polity. I would view um, corporate tax reform as one of these, um, uh, preventing companies from moving to take advantages of lower corporate tax rates, 
is something that could be highlighted and played more well, uh, more, more better, sorry, <laughs> more well is not a word, but, but could be highlighted to, to promote general domestic support for multilateral initiatives. I think climate is another one of these, health is another one of these. Uh, our government doesn't talk about this enough. Um, we're not gonna build new multilateral institutions, which is why it's so important to work with the ones we have and not leave a vacuum for China to fill as it has been doing. But this would require more of the type of cooperation we see in the Basel Committee, something that started after the Bretton Woods system basically collapsed, but has been quite important in um, uh, improving the, uh, the uh, safety of the global financial system. Finally, industrial policy. Um, we could talk about this for hours, but uh, the best industrial policy and I think this was mentioned in the, uh, in the first panel, is workforce development, it's education. It's investing in people so that you can develop new industries and also address some of the um, inequalities that have led to globalization backlash up until now. That's it. Thank you. Nice extension. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. So I'm going to, just a reminder, we're going to go to 150 instead of 145 because we stopped, uh, started a bit late. I'll ask a, f a couple of questions and then start going around and asking. So I'll intersperse questions from the audience with some of my own. So just for starters, one of the things that stood out to me from the slides that you presented was that global trade, as you talked about, really exploded in the 90s and 2000s. Can you just give a sense of what it was? Was there, was it like some perfect storm of factors that led, that induced that? Or um, is it hard to say? I think, I think there was a, a perfect storm of factors. Um, uh, one huge factor was just the um, sort of entry of China into the world economy, the uh, collapse of the Soviet bloc and the entry of those countries, the trend toward reform in uh, much of the other emerging uh, and developing world, um, you know, India's 1991 reform. Uh, of course, those events actually also had distributional effects because they vastly increased the global supply of labor. So any trade economist would tell you that this is going to have an effect on global wages, you know, for um, factor endowment reasons. And um, uh, but but obviously the the ability to exploit the, these new comparative advantages raised trade immensely. Um, another factor was the growth of finance. Um, finance and trade are complementary. Um, Yun Shin at the BIS has emphasized how the ability of more finance allows you to build more finely articulated global value chains. And that growth in global value chains is a large part of the, um, the growth in, in trade as measured in my chart, just measuring gross trade to GDP, although value added trade also, um, also rose. A final factor, I think, is the dollar, and that's going to be the topic of the next panel. I don't want to say too much. But the fact that the dollar emerged as a global currency, as a global numeraire, um, I think was important for promoting trade. That's great. So that's a great segue into my next question, which is obviously the dollar underpins so much of global trade and finance today. Um, but, and, but the role of the yuan has been growing. Do you see it sort of essentially losing ground to China's yuan going forward? Uh, I just, I just, you know, I don't want to predict what will happen over the next 30 years, but I just, uh, I just don't see it. Uh, China has closed markets. Um, all of the issues we discussed in the last panel about the um, rule of law in China, the uh, you know, growing authoritarianism, uh, the uh, tighter grip on the free market, these are not conducive to, to, to having a global, global currency. So. Um, I don't see the dollar as being, being dislodged, you know, but part of it is because there's no alternatives. Um, uh, a lot of countries are worried about weaponization, um, but they, they, don't, they don't really see where to go. So you know, if you're, if you're uh, China, you might, you might move your reserves you know, somewhere, and they, they have been, or to an offshore custodian, but um, ultimately, that money will flow back to the U.S. and be held probably in the treasury market. So I, I don't see the dollar going anywhere, anywhere soon. 
Great, okay, uh, another question for you. The first two sessions touched on it a teeny bit, not much, um, and I'd just like to get your sense as a topic that we cover a lot at CEPR, uh, government debt. Um, uh, we talk about it often here in the US, but it's happening all around the world, and I just want, would like to hear your thoughts about whether and to what extent growing uh, government debt poses risks for developed and developing countries. Uh, in, in the, and the pace of globalization, too. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in the, in the uh, current environment uh, of high and rising interest rates, particularly at long term, on long-term uh, debt, which we've been seeing in the advanced economies, particularly in the U.S., uh, the burden of debt is becoming a much more serious threat, and it's something we have to, we have to worry about. I'm not saying we have to turn to austerity immediately, but um, uh, some thought has to be given to what to do. And the, the sort of shenanigans about the budget in Congress are not addressing at all the, the, you know, the pressing long-term issues in the US, which are about Medicare and Social Security. Right. And those have kind of been taken off the table. Until we deal with those, uh, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna happen. In the, in the developing world, uh, you know, the World Bank judges that more than half of low-income countries are in or near debt distress. Uh, about a quarter of middle-income countries um, uh, in the same situation. Uh, but our, our mechanisms for uh, dealing with this, essentially for allowing uh, poorer countries to restructure their debts, are very clunky and not uh, likely to be effective if there's a major slowdown in the global, in the global economy. Uh, just yesterday, Zambia um, announced uh, that it had closed a deal with its private creditors, at least with the, the private creditor committee, and this follows deals with um, uh, official bilateral lenders, including China. And it really took you know, Janet Yellen going to Zambia in January and um, uh, uh, after talking to the Chinese, sort of speaking publicly about this to move this process along among the official creditors, and then the private creditors followed. But Zambia's debt, debt problems have been a, a, a sort of front burner issue since 2021. If this is the pace at which we can resolve developing country debts, if we have an outbreak uh, on the level of the 1980s crisis, it's gonna be really, really hard to manage. And so I think the global community, you know, one area for international cooperation, and this has to involve China because they're such a big lender to poor countries, um, global community has to streamline the processes for debt um, restructuring. Great, okay, so I'm gonna ask one more question then I'm gonna open it up and then you know, I may come back, but uh, my question relates to a topic that came up in the last session about sort of demographics and fertility. Um, and I think the thing that in the last year or two has surprised me the most was seeing projections of how the population is going to unfold by region of the world over the next 25 or 50 years. So I'm just gonna give you some very specific numbers. I refreshed this last night to make sure that these numbers were up to the minute. So if we exclude Africa, look at the entire world, so we're, I'm gonna differentiate, so it, the, the population of Africa versus the rest of the world. So the population of Africa, according to projections from the UN, uh, is going to grow from 1.51 billion to 3.35 billion in the next 50 years. It's gonna grow by 122%. The rest of the world, every, US, China, Europe, India, everything combined, is projected to increase by 6%. That strikes me as a very big change, and I'm just wondering what that is. So we're talking about things that are very current today, um, I'm just wondering, that seems to me like it's going to have a first order effect on globalization and, and some of the things that you're talking about. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, obviously there's uncertainty around projections, but. Oh yeah, but, but um, it's probably, you know. In the ballpark. Might, these might be some of the more easily, easy to project numbers. However, however, to the extent that Africa can be successful in development, you know, if every, every country in Africa could be Kenya, that would, that would probably reduce the population pressures. Um, so if you think about the global situation, basically the UN projects that by around 2085, global population growth is gonna turn negative. Right. And this is, um, uh, you know, 
good if you were worried about emissions. It might be bad if you're worried about things like uh, innovation and productivity growth. You know, your colleague Chad Jones has right. written a lot about this, and uh, or I commend you know his uh, his work uh, to you to if you want to learn more about it. Now, if you think about Africa growing at these at this pace while the rest of the world is either stagnant or shrinking, it really raises questions about what the development model is because you know, they're, they're not going to be able to export their way to prosperity right. the way East Asian countries were. Um, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, they'll have huge internal markets. So growth will, will probably have to be largely internally generated. And how that happens is, is, is not totally clear to me. Um, there'll be a lot of service-driven growth. And Kenya has done, you know, it, it can be done. I mean, Kenya's growth has been you know, 80% in services, including financial services. So it can be done. But you need um, uh, to put in place a lot of structural reforms. Again, I come back to education as being a key, a key input that they will need. But also, looking across the continent, which is very diverse, uh, you, know, you have countries like Kenya that are pretty successful, quite successful, uh, where macro policies are strong, and that has supported growth. But you have countries that, for example, in, in um, French West Africa, which are you know which have recently had coups, which are, are um, resource driven, where um, you have the Wagner Group operating, where you have a lot of Chinese influence uh, th that's pushing out the old French influence, and where the prospects for growth are really really limited. You also have vulnerability to climate change, which um, you know has not is not really being addressed in the most, um, in the most vulnerable countries. Uh, you know, research uh, by a number of scholars, including my colleague Ted Miguel, indicates that um, you know, climate disasters lead to civil strife. Civil strife leads to failed states. In failed states, it's very hard to deliver um, the, the resources either to, to support the population or to um, uh, do climate adaptation investments. And so, you know, this, this, this is sort of a problem, I think, for uh, Africa, but also more broadly for the global community, which is one reason why I'm really glad that Africa is now coming to the table in the G20. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So with that, thank you, uh, Maury, for that. I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience. We've got a knot right here. And then Cheng Tesh. Thank, thank you. Um, wait a minute. I'll stand up. Uh, for the middle of the day, I would just want to bring up a few things that are related to globalization. It was mentioned here that um, you know there's a backlash against you know there's fewer free countries that there's a backlash against globalization, and the question is why and what is the dark side of globalization, if you want. So one thing since you mentioned Africa and stuff is you know secrecy jurisdictions, you know, opaque corporations, uh, kleptocracy being enabled by the US and UK, all these things that we can try to uh, deal with in the sense of whether we are, you know, always helpful and it's always great or we can do something to do so, to, so things are better. Oh, no, uh, I'm not. You're absolutely right that, that you know, when, when um you know, when I, when I mentioned multilateral projects that might command widespread support, uh, you know, corruption, the use of the financial system to uh, channel corrupt resources, uh, uh, you know, th these are topics that, that get routinely mentioned in the G20 communiques and then nothing, nothing much happens. So, um, you know, in order, in order to, to make the case to, uh, Voters, or, or um, you know, even if they're voters in Russian elections, <laughs> that you know that, that that globalization offers benefits. These, these topics have to be dealt with very openly and transparently and effectively, and that has not happened yet. Chang Taisha, we've got a. We, do we have a mic here? Uh, uh, Mori, I, I wonder whether you can say something more about the world trade institutions, because that's the part that I, I see is. But we're right now uh, uh, under the most stress, as we talked about in the first panel. I mean, think about one of the reasons that these the Bretton Woods institution works works so well after the war is because the U.S. was committed to them. 
it's clear that the that the sort of the 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 commitment is not there anymore, or or what the commitment is to I, I don't know. So, like, can you speculate on like what? strengthening the WTO would look like so that it would be consistent with the political goals of the US, it would be consistent with a world when the three largest countries in the world are throwing around $200 billion of subsidies for semiconductors, like what rules can one put in place? Like a, how can we design a system in, that the US, can, the US and the world can support? Uh, well, you know, historically, the, um, there was supposed to be a triad of, um, of institutions. I don't call them Bretton Woods institutions because the third was never discussed at Bretton Woods, the International Trade Organization. And it was, um, uh, it was, it was set out uh, in 1948 in the Havana Charter. And, um, uh, you know, the U.S. Senate never ratified it. And so it never happened. And so instead, um, trade reform uh, took place through the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which had been set up earlier uh, in the expectation that there would be an ITO. But the GATT was quite successful in uh, multilateral tariff rounds. And finally, in the, in the mid-90s, um, agreement in the Uruguay round was reached to set up the WTO. It was sort of, like, I guess, the last great you know, multilateral institution that was created. And it's had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of issues, <laughs> including including with the United States, which uh, led to the you know the regrettable um, decision in the Trump administration, which has not been reversed to basically disable the appellate, the appellate process. Um, you know, it, it sort of has the process has inched forward with with a couple of agreements. Most recently, an agreement on fishery subsidies, which, you know, may not sound like much, but, you know, it's an agreement, so it should be treasured. It doesn't go far enough. But there, there, there are a lot of areas where, um, you know, WTO reform is, is really badly needed. And, um, uh, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the concerns about how the appellate process has worked in principle, um, you know, some of these are legitimate and I think could be, could be addressed. Um, subsidies are a huge issue, you know, it just, you know, the WTO never was willing to grapple with Chinese subsidies and how they might affect the global trading system. And the, you know, the subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act are totally at odds with, with WTO rules. But there are other areas that are really important. If you think about um, the fact that the WTO disciplines really don't um, uh, stop um, food export restrictions, which have been used by a number of countries uh, uh, and which greatly, you know, can worsen um, uh, uh, starvation around the world. So there's a whole raft of issues. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of eager to hear, you know, Emily mentioned that this is being rethought in the Biden-Harris administration. I'm eager to, eager to hear what's on the table because I think it's, you know, we're, we're sort of now in a free-for-all situation where the WTO you know, is, is sort of viewed as um, toothless and, um, hmm? and then, yeah, and it's been, been rendered toothless. You know, the teeth have been pulled by some of its most prominent members. And so, um, you know, again, I think, I think we need to, you know, it's sort of amazing we were able to set up these institutions. I think we have to engage with them and try to make them functional as best we can. Caroline. My question was actually on this very same topic, and that, and I'm heartened to hear that you think we should strengthen engagement with the multilateral institutions, and that and that they can still work for us. But it seems like there are two big challenges. One is just the membership that where you where you have an institution with U.S., China, um, and if you think about the World Bank and IMF, Russia, others uh, there, it's very difficult. And then the other problem is getting the funds for them through Congress. So what exactly can you do to strengthen these institutions in a way that they can compete? I mean, through the Belt and Road, China's reportedly put $1 trillion into countries around the world. How, how do you fill the vacuum with, with those institutions? Is it money? Are there reforms? 
what do you think could be done? Well, I think I think money is important, and I think you know there's a there's a strong case for the new the 16th quota reform, bringing in more resources, and that could actually happen. It's not it's not out of the question. You know, again, I think the U.S. is sort of the linchpin of that. Um, less likely that there'll be more capital at the World Bank, but. Um, yeah, I think the I, I was heartened that there is a new uh, president of the World Bank with a lot of private sector experience, who is really devoted to um, addressing the climate problem and to leveraging um, the existing capital in a way that might bring more resources to climate projects in the developing world. So I think that's a that's a very important aspect of of the engagement. Um, you know, one, one sort of conundrum that I have that I don't know how we're going to address is the fact that um, as countries like China grow, the um, uh, um, sort of equity structure of these institutions is becoming increasingly anachronistic. And it's clear that the US will never agree to any reform of voting shares that takes away its veto power. So we may get through this quota reform without doing much on uh, the voting shares, but what happens in the future is not clear. Which to me means that the US, you know, if the US is gonna keep this monopoly position, it needs to raise its, raise its game with the global south. So the global south sees the US as actually operating in its interests. And going beyond just, you know, you know, appointing an Indian American as the head of the as the head of the World Bank, which India welcomed and which was uh, you know cosmetically very good, but doesn't really address the underlying issue. But I you know I come back to the point that if 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 the U, you know, China does not want to leave the World Bank, they don't want to leave the IMF. Their positions in these organizations are politically important to them, and if the U.S. just disengages. Um, it leaves a bigger vacuum for China to fill, either at these institutions or by setting up rival institutions or by you know, pushing the BRICS, which you know, to date has, has not done much, in my view, other than you know, create a few headlines. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's, not just, it's not just engaging, it's really changing the orientation of our attitude toward toward the global south. And that's also you know, an imperative in view of what we're trying to do geopolitically in terms of Ukraine, in terms of the Middle East. Um, and that's going to require money. You know, it's also going to require um, diplomacy. But those things you know, are essential. We have one more question over here, above, uh, Chris, right, right there. Um, one, uh, just I wanted to relate it to this. I heard this statement, though, Maury, two months ago. And I'm curious if, there's, if this resonates with you. I was at a conference, this is, this is not my area of expertise, that sometimes people feel like China brings an airport and the US brings a lecture. Is that, is that, I thought that was catchy. I don't know if that, is there some truth to that? You, you know, I... Okay, just uh, maybe, I, I wanna get to our, we've got one more yeah, question, so maybe okay. bundle in your answer to that with I whatever will, his will. question is. No, that was great humor. Hi, I'm Dhal, <laughs> I'm a Stanford and a Berkeley alumni, and um, the question I had uh, was about uh, uh, economically supporting Global South, so all things considered from an economics point of view, uh, the, contra uh, the contrast in that with what COVID-19 has exposed, right? The supply chain, weakness of supply chains, and the need to have redundancy, so, and, and have maybe presence of the supply chain in the US. So how do you contrast uh, uh, supporting Global South at the same time having redundancy and higher costs? Well, I, th I think Part of the cost of um, supporting, I mean, you, you know, again, unless you're going to give lectures, right? There's, there's, you know, it's cheap to support the global south through lectures. So there needs to be investment. There needs to be investment in redundancy. And I think one of the, you know, one, one of the stresses about the, the pandemic that I, I alluded to but didn't go into detail is the fact that, you know, vaccines were qu quickly available throughout the advanced countries in, 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 you know, they were in excess supply. and They didn't reach the global south. And uh, the consequences probably could have been 
far more negative than they were. We, we don't really know why Africa was relatively resistant, re resilient, but it was. Uh, so this is, this is something that definitely needs to address. But you know, it, it wasn't only the, um, you know, the advanced countries. You know, India is a major producer of vaccines and of medical uh, supplies, and it also restricted exports at some, at some points. Uh, so, um, you know, we do need to distribute production more, more globally uh, when, when uh, um, these events happen. And this, this requires thinking more about the intellectual property regime um, for vaccines and uh, how we arrange that. But there was a lot of interesting debate and proposals uh, through about, you know, the end of 2021. And once uh, vaccines were largely effective in containing the pandemic, this has stopped. But there are going to be other pandemics. And, uh, you know, basically everyone was predicting that the next big one would be some form of avian flu on the, on the uh, model of 1918. Um, uh, that could have been much more destructive even than COVID. And it's, it's coming. It's coming. We haven't solved the problems that, that give rise to these um, zoonotic viruses getting into the human um, ecosystem. And we're, not, we're, not, we're just not ready. We're still not ready. And um, you know, our memories are much too short. OK, so with that, we should wrap up. Maury, thank you so much for delivering such a great keynote. Thank you.